Gitco News special coverage of Bitcoin 2023 is brought to you by Coin Payments. Crypto payments made easy. Welcome back. I'm Michelle McCory. This is Kitco News coming to you from Bitcoin 2023 here in Miami. Bitcoin is seen as the sound money solution to fiat debasement and devaluation, but Bitcoin is still priced in fiat. Well, my next guest says it's a matter of time before Bitcoin becomes the unit of price, and sooner rather than later, all energy will be priced in Bitcoin. Greg Foss is a Bitcoin strategist and a partner at the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund. Greg, great to see you in person. Welcome back. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me back. And very nice to have you here at the conference. All right, so Greg, let's start off with this thesis that you have that all energy will be priced in Bitcoin. Now, granted that the petrodollar is not looking as sound as it used to, and we are seeing an accelerating trend of de-dollarization, some countries are opting to trade in their own currencies with each other. For example, China and Brazil recently signing a deal to that end. And China and Russia have been trying to destabilize the petrodollar. We're seeing other countries opting to use other currencies to purchase oil. For example, Indian companies have been buying uh, oil using the ruble and also using the United Arab Emirates dirham. We're seeing stronger cooperation between China and Russia, Russia uh, rather China and uh, Saudi Arabia as well, China and Russia and China and Saudi Arabia as well. Saudi Arabia stating that it's open to accepting you want for its oil. Saudi Arabia also saying that it's agreeing to become a dialogue partner in the Shanghai Corporation Organization and ties between China and Saudi Arabia further cemented after China brokered a peace deal or an agreement to resume diplomatic relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia, of course, big oil producers there. So pieces are falling into place, making the petrodollar look increasingly shaky. But how do we go from that to all energy being priced in Bitcoin? Break that down for us. Well, it's a big question and it won't happen quickly, but it's a process. Um, let's start with the fact that I'm an engineer. And the first law of thermodynamics is basically that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So it's the law of conservation of energy. So the big picture to me would be it makes sense to have natural resource energy priced in digital energy. I think of Bitcoin as digital energy. And so from the law of conservation of energy, that makes sense. You keep the loop closed. But let's start with what the petrodollar is, um, which is a very strategic advantage for the United States. So it's not surprising that some of the not so friendly nations of the United States are looking to destabilize the petrodollar. What does it mean when oil and natural gas are priced in US dollars? It means essentially that the USA can print yeah. energy. Think of that strategic advantage that that has and the flip side, the negative uh, effects it has for a country like Russia. Russia is selling its valuable natural resource energy for US dollars that are debasing, firstly, but also that can be frozen. US Treasury assets get frozen and, and whatnot. Well, it so it was selling its totally right. energy in dollars, but given the sanctions, it's now moved away from that. There you go. But they're not the only nation that would be subject to those uh, sure. uh, challenges. If we bring it back to the idea, and you, you did mention this, that Bitcoin is priced in fiat. Fiat is just a measuring stick. Your house is priced in fiat. The value of your house hasn't really changed. And that shelter still is equally valuable today as it was 30 years ago. The only thing that's happened is the price of that house measured in US dollars has increased because of the unit of account, which is the US dollar, has decreased in value on a relative basis. So when we say that Bitcoin is priced in fiat, that's just a measuring stick. But I like to say one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. You know, there will be a time when fiat is actually priced in Bitcoin, not the flip side. And you have to understand that. That is certainly what a lot of people at this conference are hoping for, hyper-Bitcoinization. But how do we get there? And how does it go back to the idea that you think 
energy will be the first step in this process. Energy will maybe not be the first step because we're seeing the first steps right now, but energy will be the most important step. That will be the big event that I believe causes, you know, people to realize why Bitcoin is so darn cheap at a price that it's currently trading at today relative to where it could go priced in fiat. Now, again, pricing something in fiat is like pricing something in a ruler or measuring something in a ruler that continuous, continuously changes, right? I mean, the government's changed the length of a, of a ruler. So you can't rely on that unit of account. Ultimately, I believe there will be a time when everything else is priced in Bitcoin. And that is the truest measure of account, Bitcoin. Bitcoin right now yes. changes relative to fiat, right? Correct. So fiat Correct. is changing all the time. And so is Bitcoin. But Bitcoin, which is priced in fiat, right. is also changing all the time. Fair enough. So at some point, you would need a stable, I guess, value of Bitcoin. If, uh, if we go back to the principle that one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, then we don't get confused with, you know, the, the relative trading pair. We call it a trading pair. So, you know, much like the Canadian dollar trades is a trading pair against the US dollar, yeah. the Bitcoin trades as a trading pair against the US dollar. That trading pair is on its way out, in my opinion. And that's why if you start with the, how about this? What is Bitcoin worth in a barrel of oil? Okay, so you have a volume of oil. How much of that barrel of oil does one Bitcoin buy? You've taken the US dollar out of the equation altogether. Does one, one, does one Bitcoin equal, so you know, you could do the math in your head, $30,000 US per Bitcoin, one barrel of oil equals, you know, we're running with it, but that will change over time so that you measure Bitcoin in barrels of oil, not in fiat. And not looking at that intermediate step that you did. There you go, bingo, bingo, dollars. bingo. Okay, but how does this trend begin? Does it begin with, with Russia? Could. Selling yeah. oil for yeah. Bitcoin, considering they well, seek to let, be Okay, so then could be for sure that's in the energy in the energy space but how does the trend begin it begins with even with the development of the bitcoin commerce you know you have places like el salvador where you don't ever transact in us dollars yeah. now it's only a small pop part of the population but it's still it's a toehold that will increase so you have it increasing at the micro level does it happen at the macro level quickly i don't know but those sorts of macro events they do happen and when they happen, they change the whole world order. But you've said that the most significant development to take us there is not going to be when people use Bitcoin to buy a country. I agree. But I agree. Yes. When a yes. country starts to transact in Bitcoin for Yes. So yeah. is it most likely that that would be Russia, do you think? I do, I do believe it would be like a Russia. But, uh, you know, it, it's more likely to be Russia than Canada. How about that? That, I think, is a very fair assumption. I have to make these types of probability, uh, uh, well, you know. we are actually seeing the G7 impose even more sanctions on Russia yeah. as of today. What would you do if you're uh, Putin? You move away from that. What about the argument that uh, we could see Putin, Russia, want to go towards gold instead? That could be. Because we're seeing the brick All right. coming up with their own... Have you ever tried to transfer a lot of gold across international barriers? borders uh other than that time i was smug uh, there you go friend. no you, well as let's just say that yeah. you could price it in gold but that's ancient technology and i'm not anti-gold but you could have gold backed you digital could. tokens on the block if you know where you're going to go from point a to point b why take a detour go straight from point a to point b point b being price everything in a digital commodity that's transferable portable verifiable everything that's beautiful about Bitcoin that you can't do with gold. I mean, how much gold currently exists in the vaults? We don't know. It's not auditable. And how much of that gold that we think exists in the vaults could be tungsten? I don't know. And I don't care. I'm not pitching gold. I am pitching Bitcoin, which is defendable yeah. by math and code. And you don't argue with that. And the idea that it's going to be energy because energy goes back to energy. Correct. It's proof of work. And it's the law of conservation of energy, which is nature, okay? You can't mess with mathematics and you cannot mess with nature. And what is the time horizon that you think this could happen by? I know I have a trading expression, right? You give a target, but not a time. Because if you do both, you'll be wrong on one, 
right? So, or not. <laughs> well, uh, you could, but I, I would just say it's a process, okay? So, you know, you look at my price target on Bitcoin and then people ultimately ask, well, when's it going to get there? And I say, I can't give both. I can give a target, but not a time. I measure the target in today's dollars. And then by the time it gets there, we do the adjustment as to what it would be in today's dollars. The same thing. How, why does it get to that price? Well, there's global macro events that include these types of uh, events. I don't know when they'll happen. I'm just very comfortable pro project, projecting that they will happen. It's just the law of probabilities. Okay. So we are seeing um, the Bitcoin uh, as a potential unit of account in yes. our thesis here. Yes. One of your other big uh Species or uh, principles yes. is that Bitcoin should also be seen as a CDS, a credit default swap yes. against sovereign debt. Now, you have a background in engineering, but you've also got, what, 30 years in, in credit? That's correct. Yeah. 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 And, and engineers tend to be good at trading bonds and credit because engineers are decent in mathematics and bonds are all mathematics. There's very little subjectivity to bonds. I mean, an equity has a growth assumption, an equity has an analyst that says, oh, the, the, the trees will grow to the moon. Yeah. Trust my growth projection. Bonds are nothing like that. Bonds are a fixed contract based purely on mathematics. And you've had, I think, what, uh, 20 years in the credit? Actually, yeah, close to 30. 30 years yeah. in credit markets. Yeah. You've seen a number of uh, financial crises. Yes, I sure have. And I believe you've even wrote uh, a thesis that was used by, what was it, the Bank of Canada? Uh, no, it was used by J.P. Morgan. Thank you for pointing that out, though. When they did their research on credit default swaps, the Royal Bank of Canada, Royal Bank. Royal Bank of Canada. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, I've done. I've been published in certain research journals. Or self well. Despite the T-shirt, our viewers can see that you. <laughs> it is T-shirt's not all good, or you know. Very credible in the credit market. Um, Thank you, Michelle. So, help our viewers understand what a CDS is sure. before we get into how Bitcoin is a CDS. All right. Debt. Very simply. I can break it down. CDS, a credit default swap, is a insurance product. When you are a buyer of a credit default swap, you are purchasing insurance. You can think of a CDS contract as the equivalent of purchasing fire insurance on your house. That simple. You have a counterparty that sells you the insurance and you are a buyer of the insurance and you agree on a price of that insurance contract. And why do you think it's going to be increasingly important to take out insurance against sovereign debt? Very simply because the so sovereign debt spiral is unsustainable. It will explode. It's only mathematics. And we have reached a point, a tipping point in the global sovereign debt where the organic growth of the debt because of the fixed coupon on that debt is growing faster than your tax base can possibly grow. Which means there's no way your tax base can keep up with just the pure interest expense on the debt. So that debt is growing organically to the point where it eventually explodes. So when you're in the United States, yes. you're the reserve currency yes. of the world so far, yes. till now, yeah. um, you can just carry on printing more dollars. I agree, until you can't. Because Venezuela assumed they could just carry on printing more dollars until people ended up throwing those dollars in the street. Now, it's not going to happen quickly in the United States. And, and let me be very clear. I do not want it to happen in the United States. I love the United States. All right. I'm a Canadian. We talked about that. You're South African. Neither of us wants the U.S. to fail. Well, I'm, I'm South African and American. So okay. we don't <laughs> want it don't because America is yeah. free. America defends freedom. America defends all the principles I stand for, but you cannot maintain this debt and assume that the world will continue to fund the borrowing needs of, of the United States because it will crowd out all other borrowing in the world. Well, and also, as we discussed at the top of this interview, we have this de-dollarization. Correct. To where faith in the dollar is uh, being eroded because of this unprecedented... Well, every single fiat current fails over history. Yeah. The USA will be the last of the current fiats to fail. So you have a particular way to determine the value yes. of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. um, the fulcrum index. Yes. Determining the value or price of Bitcoin yeah. in relation to sovereign debt. Correct. It's based on uh, what a basket of, of G20 nation. 
Correct. And the credit default swap prices of those G20 nations. So break that down for us. So it won't be simple. And I just want to thank you for doing the research that you look back in my, in, you know, in, in, in my history. Um, I always take everything from a credit angle. Credit is the most important financial market in the world. It's far bigger than the equity markets. It's far more important. And it also has a prior claim. So it ranks higher in the capital structure. The thesis is based on the fact that the fiat system is inherently unstable because of this debt balloon, okay? And there is an open market contract called a credit default swap, which prices the probability of default of each of these G20 nations. It's an open market. It exists. It's like an open market for insurance. So my thesis takes the debt burden of each country and multiplies it by the insurance value or price, open market insurance price, accumulates it and says, hey, this is what Bitcoin is. It is an insurance contract on all the fiats, right? This is a value. That's what Bitcoin brings to the table. All fiats will eventually fail. There'll be different rates of failure. The USA will likely be the last fiat that fails, but they all fail. Look at history. So you can take those open market insurance rates, multiply it by that the debt outstanding, and you can see it's a dynamic measurement because as the credit default sw spreads change or the debt burden changes, those two things multiplied together increase the intrinsic value of Bitcoin. You could say, well, what if debt burdens decrease? I'll say they can't because we've reached the point where the debt spiral is too large. That is assuming that people collectively view bitcoin as that in we talked a little bit that fair we did, we did. and it's cute that didn't work yeah. out well that's good well that's cool so there's all sorts of models that value bitcoin there's all sorts of models that value an equity doesn't mean that any particular model is the go-to model this is assuming that other people take your there it started bitcoin it's already started is a yeah. sovereign uh debt in insurance correct so you, again, because our viewers that haven't watched the first yeah. interview are going to say what you said, Bitcoin has intrinsic value. That's correct. And intrinsic value uh, usually means something that has a concrete, tangible value. Or as we discussed with equities, you di different ways to um, calculate that. That's right. Uh, earnings, revenue, right. stream, yeah. okay. assets. Well, uh, how, how does gold have value? I mean, it's the same sort of thing. Gold has a price because people view it differently. They view it as a store of value. They could view it for industrial use. They could view it for all sorts of different things. There's not just jewelry. That's fair. There's not one single model that it comes up to with that. There you go. Not large, but is potential. There are many different models that, that contribute to a market price. And that market price is, you can't argue with it, right? That is the price set by the market at any given time. How did people come up with that valuation? Some people use this model. Some people use this model. It doesn't matter. It trades for this price because of a supply demand at that price. Uh, so based on the fulcrum index, yes. where does that mean we see the price? Of in, current, in current values using credit default swaps and uh, using my assumptions, easily over 400,000 US dollars per Bitcoin in today's, use, in today's markets. If you bought Bitcoin right now to yeah. mature yeah. against yeah. G20. What does it mean? You're getting insurance that should be valued over $400,000 for less than one-tenth of the price. It's trading under $30,000. Pretty good deal. Pretty good deal. I'm not sure, but that's why I purchased Bitcoin. Right. So let's focus on uh, this idea that you said all fiat is programmed to debase. Yes. I don't disagree with that, but break that down. Uh, it starts with the debt spiral, right? The only way to solve this spiral is by what's called an error term. You can't possibly generate the tax revenues to keep up with the organic growth of the debt spiral. That means you have to plug the equation. Otherwise, the left-hand side of the equation doesn't equal the right-hand side of the equation. So when that happens, you have to plug it with an error term. I call the error term printing money. 
and that's what it is. So when you look at the United States, obviously there's a big debate right now with raising the debt ceiling. Yes. Uh, Republicans and Democrats yes. are at an impasse, yes. it would appear. Yeah. Uh, Secretary, uh, uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said it would be an, a catastrophe. It would. Um, we have played this game before, though. Politically, there is usually drama. There is. And then they sort of figure it out right yeah. at, at, at the end. Yeah. Um, although potentially things are a little bit more politically toxic this time around. <laughs> um, oh, the fact that Bitcoin hasn't really been rallying so much on yeah. this, is that under the assumption that they will get this sorted out? Okay. Is, is that because there's... A little bit, I think so. Like, would you... Ex- yeah. Is, is the Bitcoin market not really pricing in? Bitcoin market is too, still too small. In the context of global financial assets, Bitcoin is a very small market. So I think you have to look at other markets for those signals rather than just Bitcoin. But let's talk about the debt ceiling quickly. I, it is political theater. How many times has it bumped up against the limit and then they fix it only to come back to have to adjust the limit down the road? Now, look, I'm betting... It's not certain, but most likely that they do solve the debt, the current debt fiasco. But, but we're going to printing. I mean, that's oh, no, no. Oh, but the, that's fair. Yeah. But they have to be able to print. Essentially, yeah. here's the here's the flip side. We're going to be back at the table in less than eight months because one and a half trillion will do nothing, because that'll get used in in less than six months. So we're going to be back at the table in less than six months, negotiating another increase in the debt ceiling. Ridiculous. At, at what point do you see the Bitcoin price and fiat start to factor in uh, U.S. soft? I really enjoy our because you try and come with different different angles all the time. I cannot tell you that. All I can tell you is I think Bitcoin is extremely cheap on a number of metrics, and I'm comfortable buying it at thirty thousand because I think that it is so darn cheap. And, you know, I use one model that uses credit default swaps. I can use another model that values Bitcoin at over $2 million in today's dollars. Is that going back to bonds? It is bonds and it's global financial assets of which the largest global financial assets is debt. So, yes, it rests on the debt thesis. But you have debt, then you have real estate, then you have equities all summing up. Break that down for us. Sure. The total global financial assets in the world today are 900 trillion US dollar equivalent, okay? Which includes global financial debt, 400 trillion US dollars. Right below that, 300 trillion of global real estate. Below that, 100 trillion of global equity. And then there's a catch-all bucket of another hundred trillion, which includes your gold, which is anywhere between five and ten trillion dollars. It includes commodities. It includes all currencies. So, adding it up, four hundred plus three hundred plus one hundred plus one hundred. That's your nine hundred trillion dollars of total global financial assets. Okay, that's your addressable market for Bitcoin, measured in U.S. dollar fiat today. Let's play some games. What if Bitcoin gets a 5% market share? 5% of 900 trillion, like 45, four, do the math, 45 trillion, right? What's 45 trillion divided by the fixed supply of Bitcoin of 21 million? Over 2 million US dollars per Bitcoin in today's dollars. I don't care about anything else. I own Bitcoin for the next 20 years. If you ask me how it gets to my price target, I don't care. How does it get to 5% of total? Uh, Because it's the world's best store of value based on math and code that cannot be manipulated by any any centralized authority. Yeah, so that is, just to play devil's advocate, working on the assumption that at some point Bitcoin takes 5% of global assets. And I know you're saying, why can't it take more? There you go. I know, I know. There you go. I'm playing. How about we start at 1%? An interesting choice, which yes. we'll get back to. Okay, yes. start at 1%. Because right now, it's at $500 billion, or one half of a trillion dollars, on $900 trillion in total. Gosh, it's so minuscule, and it could be so huge. Well, it's interesting because uh, you've said that bonds are the dumbest investment anyone could make. Oh, uh, here comes uh, the hate mail. Here comes the hate mail. 
Well, actually, uh, you're getting some support from Bloomberg Intelligence. Okay. Um, that uh, bonds should be replaced by Bitcoin is actually gaining traction. Okay. In shall we say, the mainstream media. Yeah. Uh, there is a report in Bloomberg Intelligence by their senior market structure analyst, Jamie Douglas Kautz. Okay. Um, and he makes the point that debasement is undercutting asset return. Correct. That bonds are far underperforming, the USMT. Exactly. Um, and that we have Bitcoin potentially zeroing in on a 300 trillion debt market. Okay. And See, he said 300 trillion. The actual number is 400 trillion. I'm not going to knock his numbers, but I'm using Institute of International Finance. So, uh, but this idea uh, that with you know uh, debt levels at extremes and monetary debasement uh, certainly unlikely to slow anytime soon. That investors are starting to view Bitcoin as a suitable I love Leo it. asset. Yeah. He says that he does see one uh, percent. Okay. Of, of uh, portfolios. Yeah. Hitting. Bitcoin. All right. I would say you, you start, you have to go through 1% to get to 5%. So go back and circle to the idea of why bonds are the dumbest. Okay. And now all you You're bond guys, with yeah. One, right? with, with, with this particular. Doesn't make me right or him right, but yeah. here's the coolest thing. Look, I spent my entire career in bonds. Bonds make sense at a certain price. They just don't make sense at today's price, given where inflation is, but more importantly, where fiat debasement is, because bonds are a fiat contract. Don't ever forget, a bond is a fiat contract. And if it's priced in something that's debasing, I'm not arguing that it's highly likely that you get your $100 back. You lend to the USA $100 today for 10 years. It's highly likely, not certain, that in 10 years you get your $100 back as well as the contractual payments of interest. The problem is in 10 years, that $100 is worth 60 bucks because of fiat debasement. Yeah, it's not a great investment because everyone runs the math as I invest 100 and I get 100 back and I get my coupons and that's called a yield to maturity. But they assume that the value of $100 in 10 years equaled the value that it was today. So not taking into account the debasement, debasement correct. And, and inflation. They're, they're the flip side. They're the same thing. But yeah. at the end of the day, yes, you're absolutely right. Now, look, a bond is what's called a soft asset. And there are other hard assets. I know you like gold and real that's estate Bitcoin. and Bitcoin. That's, that's why I like being on your show. Because I'm not saying you have to put all your money in Bitcoin. But be careful of soft assets, which are bonds, versus hard assets that maintain their purchasing power against fiat, like real estate, like gold, like equities. Amongst those three... Bonds are the worst. Now, in a short-term trade, guys can say, hey, interest rates are going to go down, therefore bond prices are going to go up. That's a trade. That's not a 30-year investment. I'm talking 30-year investment horizon. And of course, you're including U.S. Treasuries in that. 100%. That's the biggest bond market in the world. And we've seen how uh, U.S. Treasuries have caused or certainly contributed to the banking crisis, yes. the collapse of banks yes. that bought U.S. Yeah. Treasuries. Yeah thinking that this is a safe place yep. to put your money, yep. only to have the Fed raise interest rates yep. and then have the mark-to-market value yep. of treasuries bought even like four months ago change drastically. Yep. Last time we spoke was right after Fed Chair Jerome Powell tried to assure us that the banking system was, quote, sound and resilient. Mm -hmm. um, seems to settle down a little bit as, as of yet, okay. uh, calm before another storm? In my opinion, yes, only because banking is banking. Uh, the reality is banks are very levered. They always have been. And when you are very levered, which is to say that their capital base is only 4%, plus or minus, to their total asset base, that 4%, which is your protection, can get vaporized very quickly, which means banks are frequently insolvent. And having worked at the largest financial institution in Canada in 1988 during the Latin American debt crisis, we talked about different crises that I've been to. The Royal Bank of Canada was insolvent in 1988, but it was no different than Chase Manhattan and Manufacturers Hanover and Bankers Trust in New York. Because the value of their loans, the Latin American loans, had fallen by so much that the equity value, the risk absorbing equity in the bank was vaporized. That's not healthy, but it is the fiat system. That's how it works. 
So uh, Jamie Dimon, yes. CEO of J.P. Morgan, yes. has said that he thinks it's unlikely yeah. that J.P. Morgan is going to step in and buy another bank should there be a, 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 a collapse. Be he might be forced to because, you know, did you see that UBS, which rescued Credit Suisse, is complaining that they said we were forced into this deal? Yeah. Well, they still did it. Free market, yeah. They still did it. Yeah. Jamie Morgan may be the last bank standing. Now, I, I agree. Uh, Jamie, first of all, Jamie Dimon is a very good banker, but that's like saying, you know, you're the best of a very bad bunch, right? Like, it, banking is extremely risky. And he's a very good risk manager, but when you're dealt a hand that has 25 times leverage in it, which is what a bank is, it's very hard to thread that needle all the time. 25 times leverage, to be clear, is your 4% equity capital on $100 or 100% equity base. 25 times 4 equals 100. That's your 25 times leverage. Right. And we have, what, I believe two dozen regional banks that are looking somewhat shaky. The, here's the funniest thing, Michelle. They all are shaky because they all have the same business model. Yeah. It's banking, people. Yeah. I mean, it's banking. Right. It is the model. But if you're saying that we haven't seen the last of this... Um, you know why? Because there's 5,000 banks, and I'm pretty comfortable saying we haven't seen the last of the bank failures. Why? Because in the last 30 years, 10,000 banks have consolidated or failed in the USA. So we've had guests on the show saying that they anticipate a uh, future of not too far off. Yeah. Where you have eight to 10 big banks in the U.S. Okay. A massive consolidation. That's fair. Banking sector. That's fair. I think eight to 10 is a little low. Um, let's use the Canadian model. Uh, in Canada, we have six national banks, essentially coast to coast banks. And the rule of one in 10 should typically applies in Canada, meaning our GDP is one tenth the size of the USA. Our population is one tenth the size of the USA. So take the Canadian banking model and multiply it by 10 because the USA is 10 times bigger, maybe 60 banks in the okay. USA, not eight to 10. I think that would be too much of a concentration, not to mention the fact that they have restrictions on how much any bank can hold in deposits, right? And they had to break that for JP Morgan. Well, in Canada, we don't have that restriction because we only have eight banks. But to only have eight banks in the USA, I think, well, look, we're not getting there overnight. Let's not argue. There's definitely contraction in the number of banks. Where does it end up? I don't know. Um, I'll be dead in 20 years. And I don't think in 20 years it'll get less than, you know, hundreds of banks, let alone down to measuring banks in single digits. Got you to give me a target and a timeline there. Oh, and we said where I was going to die. Uh, you know, like, here is a yeah. uh, hundred bags. Yeah. Okay. No, I said it's unlikely. I'd like unlikely be less than a hundred bags. There you go. That's fair. I like your style. What a great and you are a great reporter. You are a great reporter. Okay. Well, hopefully you live long. Thank you for that. But you know, I only go by statistics, right? I only go by statistics. I am very, very much a mathematician, correct? A math guy. Yeah. Um, and of course, that provides uh, very big problems for economic freedom if you have yep. consolidation of the banking sector, which uh, uh, brings me to the idea of a central bank digital currency. Yeah. Because the thesis or the argument is that you'll have consolidation of the banking yep. sector, which then makes it a lot easier for a central bank digital currency yes. to be implemented. Interesting. I mean, I'm not certain I agree with that thesis, but that's fine. Let's go with it. Why, why would you agree with that? Um, I mean, you can... Well, the banking sector... You can, not, you can impose it. You can impose it if you want. Right now, yeah. yeah, without it. But, yeah. but that would make it for easier cooperation. Anyway, let's assume you're going the right way. I mean, look, the, all the big bankers are going to embrace it, so therefore all the small bankers are going to embrace it as well. Okay, potentially yeah. easier when you have uh, big bankers uh, on, on board. Okay, um, all right. Not necessarily my theory, by the okay. way, but the all theory right. that's kind right. of on the show a lot. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about CBDCs because okay. you've mentioned you're Canadian. Yes. I believe that you uh, were against, of course, the uh, the vaccination mandates on the truckers in Canada. I think you, you donated to the truckers there. I No, I did not donate to the truckers, but what I did do is I backed a movement to for freedom so i want to be clear to the listeners i have no i am not anti-vax but i'm pro-choice i believe everybody should have the freedom to choose whether they should be vaccinated or not 
So when they say that the Freedom Convoy or the Trucker Convoy was anti-vax, that's not what I was supporting, and I don't believe that's what most of them. So, but here we'll go with that. So take it, take it, take it one step further. I think this is where you're going. Um, The Freedom Truckers got banking restrictions imposed upon them, correct? And so one of the solutions was Bitcoin. And I was uh, supportive of the Bitcoin as a payment mechanism to support the truckers. Correct. And in a world of CBDCs, yes. where it makes it a lot easier for government to, to impose restrictions correct. to take people out of the financial system. And yes, for the record, yes. neither saying pro or anti-vaccine, but pro people's correct. choice yep. to make that uh, decision. Yes. And that choice was taken away from them uh, because of uh, the Canadian government imposing those restrictions and pulling the Correct. financial system. And again, right. the CBDC, a programmable digital currency, yes. makes it a lot easier for the government to, to surveil. To surveil. Correct. And many people here have brought that up as a concern and do see Bitcoin as the answer to that. I agree with that. How would you see Bitcoin coexisting with a central bank digital currency, would it? Great question. So I actually think it'll enhance adoption of Bitcoin because if you have a digital currency on your phone, the government issued digital currency, the extension to buy a Bitcoin digital asset using a wallet that already has digital currencies in it, pretty simple. You wouldn't see it um, become more of a target for regulation? Oh, it's... I don't disagree, but like anything, you tell kids, uh, you know, I'm, I'm restricting you from doing this. What do kids generally do? They go, they do what you're trying to restrict them to do. They end up experimenting with it more. So you think uh, it would just drive a more... You try and restrict anything. Like, how has the war on drugs worked? Uh, I mean, I don't want to go down that road, but... I'm not concerned about government restriction. You're not concerned that a CBDC would make it harder for people. I think it'll make it get, easier, but it doesn't matter. I, I think CBDCs in, a, in, in certain forms are dead on arrival, DOA. In a great nation like the United States, I think the pushback will be substantial such that... Well, we are in the state of Florida where Governor Ron DeSantis yes, has banned I CD, there you go. CBDCs. Yeah. And um, that sentiment is also echoed by Michael Saylor, who thinks that the political landscape in the U.S. will make it such that it would not be something that would be popular with either party pushing. I hope so. So I hope he's right in that one. I, I, I get to sleep better at night after hearing that. Uh, Greg, before we let you go, tell us about the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund. Oh, thank you for asking. So I'm a partner along with uh, four pretty experienced uh, risk managers in the world. Um, Larry Lepard, who I know is a, a, a guest on your program. Mark Moss, who I also know is a guest on your program, myself, and Swan Bitcoin, Corey Clipston, who is the CEO of Swan also Bitcoin. Is he? I didn't know that. I love it. Okay, so those four are the advisors, and then we have two ex- extremely good uh, portfolio managers, James Lavish and David Foley. James is an experienced hedge fund manager, uh, a lot of experience in the debt markets, like myself, and then David Foley is currently Larry Lapard's managing partner at their Sound Money uh, portfolio based in Boston. So David and James will be the two portfolio managers. And then those, the other partners are the uh, senior advisors. But what is the fund? Bitcoin Opportunities Fund looks for opportunities within the Bitcoin ecosystem that currently are, for example, down rounds in funding in, in private companies or publicly traded Bitcoin mining companies that might have a capital structure that misprices part of the capital structure. And here's the interesting part. It's a hedge fund, so we can also short traditional finance stocks. So it's only applicable to high accredited, net worth individuals, accredited investors, accredited that, investors is that make yeah, that yeah. threshold. So we have, we currently raised the first stage of the fund. Um, we have 30 investors out of a total potential of a hundred slots, and we will start making our first investments uh, June 1st. Across the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem. And don't forget, an investment can be a long position or a short position. So we could be shorting some of the traditional finance. Right. Uh, opportunities which are mispriced or other securities that are mispriced by our view. And so you would be shorting something like a bonds? I, I, I'm not going to say exactly what we would be shorting, but there's lots of different strategies that we have experience in. A uh, uh, final question. What is yes, the ma'am. current percentage composition of your personal portfolio? 
uh, Greg Fosses. Yeah. Okay. You're probably asking, sorry, uh, the mic, if I, uh, how much Bitcoin I own? Uh, my, yeah, about 40, 40. And the rest is the... I, I own real estate. I own stocks. I own a little bit of bonds right now as a trade, not as a long-term investment. Okay. But I'm a risk manager and, uh, you know, and I, I believe you own some gold. hundred percent. I own gold. Okay. I love gold. It's just that Bitcoin is better. Okay. Well, uh, what do you think needs to happen for this hyper Bitcoinization narrative to really take hold? More stuff like you're doing. Thank you for inviting me so we can educate people on the beauty of Bitcoin. The, the best asymmetric investment opportunity I've ever seen in 35 years of managing risk. Well, we like to educate our viewers on a range of ideas and perspectives and let them make their decisions, but certainly appreciate you sharing your ideas with us. As always, Greg Foss, a pleasure. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Really? And as always, thank you for watching. I'm Michelle Mapori. This is Kitcon News coming to you from Bitcoin 2023. Keep it right here for more coverage. Kitco News special coverage of Bitcoin 2023 is brought to you by Coin Payments. Crypto payments made easy.